sometimes, sometimes you need to shout louder than what's shouting at you. Can somebody just say amen? Can somebody just say amen? Sing Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something.
comfortable with it, would you just raise both hands up into the Lord? Raising your hands is an outward expression of an inward emotion. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, the Bible says in every place of worship, people should raise hands up into the Lord. And if it's okay with you, I'd like to just pray a blessing into your life. In the name of Jesus, I thank you for your Holy Spirit that's in this room. Thank you, God. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke every demon in this room. I command by the authority of Jesus Christ that every demon will flee and leave this house and leave this property in the name of Jesus. Every tormenting spirit, we rebuke you in Jesus' name. Every spirit of infliction, we rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ. Every spirit of division in every home, in every marriage, in every family, we rebuke you now in the name of Jesus. Loosen your grip and leave in Jesus' name. I speak blessings from heaven, blessings from God, blessings from our Savior. Lord, we thank you that there's not a fault, there's not a sin that you are looking at right now. That every sin that we've ever committed, that you are not looking at it. You are not paying attention to it. You can't even remember it. Your mercy on the life of every single person in this room is endless. Your love on every single person in this room has no end. The love has no bottom, it has no height, it has no width. And I speak in the name of Jesus that everywhere you go in this room, every single one of you, the Lord will be before you, He will be behind you, He will be on the side of you. In the name of Jesus, I speak to the atmosphere of your home that every demon of affliction, every demon of division, we command you to leave their homes, leave their apartments, leave their houses, leave in the name of Jesus. Get out of their cars, get out of their office, get out of their place of work. In the name of Jesus, stop tormenting them. And I speak anointing in their life. Anointing, 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 anointing. Draw them into your presence, God. Meet them in their dreams, God. Bring them close to you. You are our Father. Give them a standing ovation. Come on. Lord, we love you, Jesus. Lord, we love you, Jesus. Let's say thank you to our worship team. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Turn around, look at four or five people and say, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're here. If someone invited you to church today, well, before we go any further, if you're already happy you came to church, would you put your hands together? You're already. You're already happy you're here. If someone invited you to church today, it is because they're a part of our church family and they understand the culture of our church and the culture of our church is to remember that the number one thing that we can do for the Lord is to tell people who we worship and where we worship. There is nothing we will do on this planet that's more important than that, telling people who we worship and where we worship. And for all of us that are a part of the Celebration Church family, I have a challenge for you. Before a year from now, what's today's date? I forgot. The 10th, the 10th, July the 10th. Before July the 10th, 2023, you will bring one person to the church family that's my challenge for you. Now, if you are new here, this is your first time, I have a challenge for you as well. 
give us one year of your life. Give us one year. I promise you, you'll never again be the same. Does anyone agree with me on that? You'll never again be the same. If you're visiting with us, we want to buy you lunch today just as an expression of saying thank you for coming to a place you didn't know any of us. You weren't even sure if you were going to like us and you came anyway. And uh, we want to say thank you for giving us an opportunity to worship with you in a very tangible way. Uh, So we want to buy you lunch today. Go out the doors on the right hand side. It says lunch on us. And every adult in this room will receive a $15 gift card. It's a Visa card. You can go wherever you want, buy whatever you want. In this day and age, you might want to use it at the gas station. I don't know. But um, uh, I want to give this, uh, this card to somebody uh, in the room. And uh, you know what, David, I'm going to give it to you. You know what? Come on over here. I don't know why. You've been a part of our church for 10 years. You're not a visitor, but I love you. I love you, brother. I love you. Um, You don't even need it, so give it away before the end of the day. (laughs) There you go. He already gave it away. Um, But anyway, uh, next Sunday is Baptism Sunday. We're very excited about that because we really make a big deal out of it. We bring the baptism tank outside into the parking lot. We play music out there like it's a true celebration. If you've never been baptized before, now is the time to do it. Scan that code and let us know that you want to come. And um, now you don't, biblically speaking, everyone should be baptized one time. You don't need to be baptized twice. But for some of you, if so much has happened in your life since your baptism and you want to be baptized again, just as an expression that you personally want to make to the Lord, you're welcome to do that. Again, just scan it. Um, If you have children that understand the process and understand what's happening, uh, many children will be baptized next Sunday as well. And so uh, if you want your child to be one of them, then you can do that. Um, Let me say this as well. It just crossed my mind. I'm having like an ADD moment, which I love. Don't pray for me. I embrace the gift. Um, If you are, if your primary language is Spanish and it stretches you to listen to English, um, and my English is Mas o menos. It's, it's, it's kind of like Texas slang, I guess. We have headsets only for the second service. We have headsets and we have translation going on. And so if any of you have family members or friends uh, that would like to come to church, but they're concerned that they're not going to understand the language, we have headsets for that. And for anyone who doesn't, um, I'm a mixture of Italian, Brazilian, and uh, raised in the country of Texas. Um, you don't understand me, go, good luck. (laughs) Uh, I just want to throw that in. So next Sunday is Baptism Sunday. And uh, right now we're going to receive our tithes and our offerings, but this is only for people who call Celebration Church their church home. So the rest of you, you can just hang out uh, for a few moments as we honor the Lord in our tithes and offerings. What you can do is grab your cell phone, Download the Celebration Church app. Type in Celebration Church TW. You want to do this because my notes to my message is inside that app. And uh, you can also take your own notes and you can email it to yourself. um, And you can look at it throughout the week or save it, whatever you want to do with it. But for those of you that uh, want to honor the Lord in your tithes and offerings, I want to share a scripture with you. It's in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. It says this, Guard your heart above all else, for from it determines the course of your life. Now, typically we take that verse and we apply it to relationships, and it is most apropos. Um, And then we say, guard your heart. However, I want to use it in the context of finances. Because everything in life goes contrary 
to give in the Lord 10% of your income. It's contrary. It, everything in life tells you that's the stupidest thing you could do. It's the scariest thing you can do. I want to say, guard your heart from that fear. Choose. I am going to live by biblical principles. I'm going to keep my eyes on the Lord. Now, if you've ever done, never done this consistently, do it for three months. Test God in this, like it says in Malachi 3.10. If you do not see God's hand moving in your life in ways you have never seen it before, then stop. Just say, hey, it didn't work for me. I'm done. I'm out. But do it for three months consistently and see what the Lord does. Uh, if you're a giver, a faithful giver, and you've seen God bless you, would you put your hands together in this room? These are all, these are all testimonies of what I'm saying is true. Let me pray for you as you prepare your gift. Father, in the name of Jesus, do inventory of every person in this room. Some need a financial miracle. Only a miracle will do. Some people need a miracle in their marriage. They need a miracle in their health. They need a miracle with their children. Lord, bless them where they need it most. Exceed their expectations. Prove your promises to be true in their life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, there's a whole bunch of people watching online. Hold on a minute. I just need to get a drink of water. I'm sorry. Um, before I get into it, I need to... Excuse me. Tell the person next to you you're happy they're there. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, Pastor Dwayne, I love you so much. Many of you don't know him, but it's the real deal. Um, all right, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> when you're Italian, every part of your body gets involved. So <laughs> what's that swimmer that used to do that in the Olympics? <laughs> Michael Phelps. All right. Um, hey, all of you online. Did you like that transition? All of you online. Just pray for me. It's got to get better in the next 60 seconds. <laughs> Extend your hand to me. Let's pray for me. Father, in Jesus' name. I got to talk to them. Don't laugh. <laughs> Some of you are really praying. Dear God, he looks in like he's in trouble. But all of you that are online, um, we know that you're not in this room. But you have chosen to open up your laptop or grab your cell phone to listen to today's service, to participate in the worship experience. You're only doing that because you love God. It's the only reason why you're doing that. And I honor you. And even though you're not in this room, um, you're part of our family. You're part of our family. And this next round of applause is just for you. Give them a big round of applause. Come on. Thank you for tuning in today. My name is Frankie Mazapika. The title of the message is Remain aggressive. Remain aggressive. Life throws so many issues and problems your direction. And most of them come from hell. I mean, to give you a visual example, it's almost as if hell just pulls out arrows and shoots them in your direction, shoots financial pressure, shoots depression, shoots anxiety, shoots all of these things towards us, shoots uh, in most scenarios, shooting uh, 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 arguments into families, shooting resentment, shooting unforgiveness. It's like a barrage of, of arrows that doesn't stop at any point. They just continue every time we wake up. And if we are not careful, we will stay in survival mode. 
We are just trying to make it another day. We are just trying to hold our family together with white knuckles. We're sitting there eating vegetables and beans, trying to get healthy. It, we, in a lot of cases, most of these situations, we have very little hope. We're just trying to make it. In this economy, we're just trying to make it. And if we're not careful, we will stay in that state of mind of just trying to make it instead of being ultra aggressive on pursuing God, worshiping God, and inviting him into our life. And I want to encourage you today to stay aggressive in your pursuit to the Lord. It's been an interesting phenomenon, especially since COVID, when COVID really started building momentum in 2020. It's been a fascinating phenomenon because many of the people that we used to worship with don't come to church anymore. I've got a lot of friends that are senior pastors and they all say the same thing. We don't know where our people went. Now, what's fascinating is when I look out to the crowd today, the sanctuary is full. But most of you, I did not know you in 2019. You came after 2020. You came after the, 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 the highs, the peak of the pandemic. And what's interesting is I think about all the people that left. And I don't know where they are. I don't know how they're living. But I would propose to you that the people that are just trying to make it are the same people that stopped being aggressive towards pursuing God, worshiping God, keeping their mind's attention and their heart's affection on God. They, they fell off to the wayside. They, they're just living life depending on their own strength. And so I'm going to share a scripture with you in just a moment to show you where this message is being based from. But my three main points today, number one, is going to be not to give up the weapons that God has given you. I'm sorry, that's point number two, but you're going to like it. That's point number two. Point number one is to not be dependent on your enemy. I know that's crazy, but sometimes we're dependent on people who don't even like us. Sure. Have you ever been there? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> to not be dependent on the enemy, I'll talk about that in a minute. To not be dependent on your own strength. Number two is to not lay down your own weapons. I'll get to that in a minute. And then number three is to retain your metal. Not metal like a, like a steel baseball bat. Metal spelled M-E-T-T-L-E. -E, your metal, your courage. So let me just dive into the verse that we're springboarding off of. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 19. And this is what it reads. It reads this, there was no blacksmith in Israel. There was no blacksmith in Israel because the Philistines would not allow it. So the children of Israel were God's children. The Philistines were the enemy of the children of Israel. And they're under bondage, so the Philistines would not allow them to have a blacksmith, for they feared that they would make swords and spears for the Hebrews. They were afraid that they would get sick of being in bondage. They would be sick of being their slave. And they would attack and break out of that bondage. So they never allowed a blacksmith to be there. So when the children of Israel needed to sharpen their, their plowshares, they needed to sharpen their picks, they needed to sharpen their axes. They, they needed to sharpen their farm equipment. They would have to go to the Philistines. The Bible says they would have to go to the Philistines and ask if they could use their blacksmith so that they could farm their own land. 
They were at the bottom of the barrel when it comes to dependency. They were completely dependent on the kindness of their enemy. Sometimes the children of God will hope and pray that the enemy would just stop. Just give me a breath. Just stop tormenting me. Stop, 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 stop. Hoping that there would be some kind of respite. There'd be some type of break. That just give me a break. You're hoping that the enemy would stop. Or you're hoping that your own strength would be there. My first point is to stop depending on the kindness of the enemy to stop bothering you because it's never going to happen. It's, you're never going to get a break. And to not depend on your own strength to scrap and get you out of this situation because you don't have the strength. If you did have the strength, you would have already done it. And the fact that sometimes we get stuck in a season that we hate, that we feel inflicted, we feel depressed, we can't get out. If you can't get yourself out, you're not the one to get you out. God has got to get you out. If he doesn't, there you go, encourage me a little bit. If he doesn't, we're all in trouble. Uh, let me give you an illustration on not being dependent on your own strength or that maybe hell will stop tormenting you. Uh, this past week, um, we, our family went to Costa Rica. And um, on, the, on the part of Costa Rica that we were at, it's on the, south, uh, the southwestern side. So that particular beach that we were at, it doesn't have white sand. It has black sand. It's very pretty, but it's black sand. And so when you walk into the water, it's clear as, as a bathtub water, but it doesn't appear to be clear because the sand is black. And so when the waves come in, it picks up black sand. And so you can't see through it. It's, it's black. You can't see your knees if you're in waist deep. It's, it's black. Uh, and so... Uh, my family was, uh, they weren't with me. They were, they were uh, up in the hotel or whatever. And, and I had my eight-year-old and we were playing in the waves. It was just us for whatever reason. There was nobody else on the beach. And, and I was about, I don't know, I was waist deep in the ocean. And she was probably chest deep. She's eight years old. And we were playing. I'm holding her hand. And every time uh, a wave would come, we'd watch the wave come. As soon as the wave got close, we would turn around and we would just kind of play. We were just playing. Just wave after wave after wave. And, and if you were, um, I don't know, on a ladder, on a 15-foot ladder, what you would see is you would see the wave as far as you can see all the way to the farthest. It's like a white line of, of these waves. It's just like a straight white line. But there's something called a rip current. That, that straight white line of waves, there's a break in it. And sometimes it's really wide, sometimes it's narrow, but there's a break in it, and it's called a riptide. And what happens with a riptide is that the tide is not coming in. It's pulling out. And then it will go in and it will go out, but it goes really, really fast. So the wave goes in, it goes out, it goes in and goes out. And when it goes in and goes out, it can pull you under the water. And so... Uh, I am chest deep or, or chest deep or waist deep, whatever I was. And all of a sudden, a riptide forms right around. This is like four days ago. A riptide forms be around my daughter and I. We get pulled back. Whoom. I go underwater. Whoom. She is underwater. Now, I have done a half Ironman before. So in a half Ironman, there's three disciplines. You have to run, you have to ride a bike, you have to swim. So... I know how to swim, but I'm not a strong enough swimmer to save anyone. My daughter, she's eight years old. She's been in swim class for several years. She knows how to swim. But when she's being pulled down, she can't swim. 
I can't swim. You're being pulled down. You're being pulled back. And so I realize I'm in a riptide and I understand that the only way you can get out of a riptide is to go against your own logic. You're looking at the beach and you want to swim towards the beach, but you can't get out of a riptide swimming towards the beach. The only way you can get out of a riptide is to defy logic and swim parallel to the sand. And so if you swim parallel to the sand, you can get out of the riptide. But you have to overcome logic. You, you want to go to the sand. You're drowning. You're getting pulled back. You have to overcome that logic, which is very hard to do because you're fighting for your life. Well, the trouble was I could not do that because I can't sit there. And I have no time to explain to my eight-year-old whom I'm hanging on to her leg to keep her above water that, hey, sweetheart, we need to swim that way. So we are going underwater. <laughs> Back up, whoom, underwater, whoom. We're trying to swim. I'm pushing her forward and I'm swimming. I'm pushing her forward and I'm swimming. I'm looking at her. She's looking at me. Her eyes are big and I'm telling, Kate, we're okay. We're okay. She's looking at me and she's like, Daddy, I don't like this. I don't like this. I want out. I want out. She, God bless her, she didn't lose her mind, but she's saying, I want out. I look to the shore and the sand is so far away because we've been pulled so far out that I thought to myself that I don't know if we can get that far. Kate turns around and looks at me and I look at her and I have the thought. I'm about to lose her. We're just being pulled down. She I'm holding her leg and I'm pushing her forward. She, she, the wave comes down on her and pulls her down. I still got her leg. I have to let go to grab her waist to pop her back up. It was a fascinating thing because all of a sudden she says, Daddy, I can touch the sand. It's like, oh God, thank you, Jesus. So I reach down to touch the sand and we start running, swimming, running, running, swimming. But every time we'd run, we'd get pulled back. We'd run, we'd get pulled back. Obviously, we made it out. That was four days ago. We made it out and I'm walking on the sand and she's now, now she's breaking. I'm breaking. And she looks at me and she goes, when I got pushed down into the sand, all I, saw, I opened up my eyes and all of a sudden I saw this bright light with this turquoise, which is absolutely impossible when you're under with black sand and black sand getting pushed up. And I realized, oh, Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you so much for saving our life. Thank you so much. But to reemphasize my first point, being dependent on your own strength to get you out of a situation that you, that you hate, a situation that you feel tormented by, you don't have the strength to do that. This kind of strength can only come from the Lord. You do not have the strength to do it. So I want to say, Frankie, you proved to yourself you didn't have the strength or the capability to get you out of that ocean. You proved to yourself you did not have the strength. But also run that in parallel to be living outside of the ocean. We don't have the strength to figure out this economy. We don't have the strength or the know-how to please our families and keep our families together. We do not have that capability. And so we have to stop depending on that. Number two, we cannot lay the weapons down. That's what I don't, that, that, is the, that was the start when the Philistines took away their blacksmith and the Israelites didn't revolt right then and there. They allowed their weapons to be taken. Now we already know that because of the first point, we don't have the strength to fight back and to get out of our situation. We've already established that point. But what is our weapon? 
In 2 Corinthians, and this is the weapon we don't want to lay down. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. It says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not logical. They're not physical. They're not emotional. They're not mental. Stop relying on that. Don't rely on that. The weapons of your warfare begin when your eyes closed and your hands raised. And I want to say, don't give up your weapon. Do not give up your weapon. Stay aggressive. It is so easy to allow that riptide to just pull you back. It is so easy to be in a state of depression and anger and resentment where you start getting mad at the people around you because you don't like your situation and your emotions say it's their fault. It's not their fault. You are not wrestling against flesh and blood. You are wrestling against spirits. You're wrestling, at, this is Ephesians six twelve. You are wrestling against the devil. You are wrestling. And we cannot lay those weapons down. Let me illustrate this point. Um, I think it was two weeks ago. Uh, I had a dream, and it was it, it was a, it was a fascinating dream to say the least. Uh, I had a dream that I was with my family, and we were doing some menial things. I don't know what we were doing, but I was with my family, just living a normal life in my dream. But then I went to sleep in my dream. Like I, I went to sleep, and it was crazy because I went to sleep in my dream, but. When I, well, when I was dreaming, <laughs> this is the funny part, I was the president of the United States. <laughs> so after I went to sleep in my dream, I was the president. And in my dream, I was in the Oval Office and I was sitting behind the presidential desk and I was looking into the camera and I was going to do a State of the Union address to the nation in my dream, and it was so real, it was so real. And, uh, and people were bringing me my script, and I remember thinking, I don't like a script, I, d I don't like looking at paper while I'm talking. I was thinking this in my dream. And, uh, and someone came up to me and was like, okay, now that you're the president, we're gonna pick out your clothes for you, so you don't even have to think about that. The only thing you have to think about is the country, you're that important. Then I woke up from my dream and I was back with my family. This is all in my dream, if you're tracking me. I was back in, with my family. And I was just a normal guy with a normal family. And I remember telling my family, guys, I have to go back to sleep. <laughs> I'm the president of the United States. I have to go back to sleep. The country needs me. <laughs> And I would go back to sleep and I was the, the president and then I would wake up and I was back with my family. I was like, guys, look, I gotta go. And so I woke up and I was just like, oh my gosh, that was a crazy dream. A couple of days later, I got to chewing on it and I realized that the Lord was showing me something. That when I'm living my life with my family and I'm living it with you and I'm living it in the streets or, or doing whatever, I'm just a normal person. Uh, I'm, I'm really not that important. But when I close my eyes, when I raise my hands, when I allow myself to stop being consumed with this world and start paying attention to this supernatural world which controls the natural world, I am very important. And I have to tell myself, guys, look, I, I, I love being your dad, I love being your husband, I'm crazy about my wife, but I'm really important over here. So. I got to go close my eyes and shut the door because this world needs me. Can I tell you, you people love you. You're, you're easy to love. I mean, look at you. You're easy to love. But you're a normal person when you're not praying. But when you are praying, oh my goodness, you are so important. 
You are changing the atmosphere every time. You, you're changing the atmosphere. Demons run and flee. In Psalms 56, 9, it says, every time you pray, the tide of the battle turns. You are so important, and hell knows that, and that's why it will throw arrows. Shoo, 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 to get us consumed. I want to tell you, stay aggressive. Close your eyes. Raise your hands. Call out on God. You're so important. So don't depend on your own strength. Don't depend on it. Number two, don't drop your weapons. And number three, refuse to lose your medal. Not not, 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 not a, like metal like in a baseball bat. Your metal, your courage in the face of a storm. Let me get a little bit more practical. Your courage when your family feels like it is being held together by duct tape and super glue. Your courage during that. Your courage. How does that courage manifest? When all hell is breaking loose, you're still raising your hands. Your eyes are still on the Lord. It's Psalms 34, 1, where it says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises will always be on my lips. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, it says, I will never stop praying. People who stop praying, people who can only pray when times are good, they don't have any metal. They, they, don't have, they have a glass chin. They, they can only handle life when it's good. Uh, they're, they're a sailor that can, that can sail a boat on flat waters only. Can't handle any waves. Can't handle any storms. Completely unreliable. The family can't depend on them. Hell laughs at them. Heaven is, is, is calling for them. They have no metal. They're really good at complaining about the situation. They're really good at being mad about the situation. Really good at folding their arms. Super good at complaining. They have no metal. Anyone can complain. It's the first thing our kids did when they were one years old. When they were one minute old. They complain. Ah, ah, ah. Is, is, what's wrong? He needs to eat. She needs to eat. The diaper's dirty. They can't do squat, but they can complain. So easy to complain. So easy to be bitter. So easy to be mad. So easy to have this face. This It's so easy. So easy. These people have no metal. You have no metal. And I want to tell you, you are so important. Your prayers turn the tide of every single challenge you have. They, every challenge you have. It is a trick of the enemy to get us so consumed about the natural world that we stop being aggressive in our prayer life. We stop being aggressive, worshiping and praising. And if you say to yourself, I would like to pray, but I just don't know what to pray. I'm not a good prayer. I'm going to help you out right now. The best prayers in this room are the people who say Jesus the most often. In fact, if all you say when you pray is Jesus, and you say it with fervor and passion, you close your eyes, you visualize his face, and you say, Jesus, 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 you will feel the Holy Spirit rise up in you, and all the other prayers will come streaming out of your mouth. Do you receive that today? Come on. We're going we're gonna to play a, a video right now. And if you go to church here, if this is your church family, you already know what I'm going to do. I'm going to play a video of somebody who was recently physically healed. Physically healed. Now, emotional healing is incredibly important, but the people around you can't measure it. And I, I like to go for things that cause other people's faith to rise. It's, it's not more important, but I'm thinking from a corporate standpoint. If you need emotional healing, I don't know why this just came to my mind, so we're going to go for it at the end of the service, and a lot of people are going to be emotionally healed, which is not something I typically go for. 
but I've learned that when that when thoughts cross my mind that weren't there two seconds ago, and you, you got to know how long I study. And so whenever something that's not on my notes comes in my head, the Lord is saying, this is what I want to do. But let me say this. If anyone here gets physically healed, if anyone here gets emotionally healed, and you do not tell us about it. You are touching the glory of God. The Lord hates that. How are you touching his glory? Because you're keeping the testimony to yourself. And the enemy will say some very convincing things to you to keep you from sharing your testimony. Such as the most popular ones. Don't tell anyone the sickness might come back. Number two, don't tell anyone they'll think you're bragging. Number three, don't tell anyone because people aren't going to believe you. All these things. And so what ends up happening is we don't tell anyone. We keep it to ourselves out of fear, fear, fear. Do you know that fear, which is a sister to stress, a brother to worry, is a spirit. Stress is a spirit. Worry is a spirit. How do we know that? 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. It says, I have not given you a spirit of fear, a spirit of fear. And so if you don't tell us, you don't open your app or you get on the email or call it or go to our website, and tell us you're holding his glory. If you don't tell your friends, you don't tell your family, you are touching his glory. It's a very bad thing. Now, I can touch his glory too. Watch how this statement will make your skin crawl. People get healed because of me. I'm so anointed. People get healed because of me. Doesn't that make your skin crawl? If I take any credit at all, I'm touching his glory. If you don't give him any credit, you're touching his glory. Why am I saying that right now? Because so many people are going to get healed this morning. I want my faith to go up because of your testimony. So don't rob me. I live off of testimonies. Let me share one right now. Take a listen to this. I have been suffering from spinal injury for somewhere around 30 years. Those injuries started from my neck and ended at the very end of my spine. The morning that I got my healing, Pastor Frankie told us, he said, those of, the, those of you that have been coming and you still can't get your healing we're going to do something different today the lord told me to do something different today and he said we're going to deal with the spirit of affliction and as i was standing in the pew that that morning you know as he's talking pastor frankie's talking the spirit of condemnation come down on me because it was telling me you can't go to the altar again timmy You've been going to the altar. How many times have you been going? People are talking about you. You know, you look crazy going back to the altar. And you're just going to walk out of here the same way again. And I thought to myself, I know that's not coming from God. But for a second, you know, I doubted it. And then Pastor Frankie spoke up and he said, if you choose not to go to the altar again today, you are choosing to live this way. And that rang loud to me. So I went down, and best I remember, we started praising the Lord first. And then we started renouncing what the Lord would drop in our spirit. And a few things that dropped in my spirit, I didn't even recognize it. I was like, why am I even thinking that? No, I'm just going to renounce it anyway. It was like 20 pounds just immediately felt like it had just dissipated away. And that morning, I could barely move my legs to get in here. And God healed me. And I've been waiting a long time. And it just proves that if you're not getting what you need, you just keep coming. And you keep believing. And it 
has been a month and a half now, and I'm pain free. And I, I can't thank God enough for it. This is what we're going to do. When I was walking off the stage, my mindset was we're going to go for emotional healing, then we're going to go for physical healing. And then I thought that's going to take too long. And God does not, he can move much quicker than that, much more efficient than that. And so what we're going to do in a moment is we're going to stand up and I'm going to ask you to repeat a prayer after me. And I, I want you to close your eyes and to the best of your ability, don't drop your head, keep your chin up. To the best of your ability, try to visualize his face and talk to what you're visualizing. Hold your hands like this, like you're going to receive a blessing. And as we're saying this prayer, people are going to get emotionally healed. I've seen it countless times. As we're saying this prayer, people will get physically healed. I've just seen it so much. If you're skeptical at this moment, you're not bad, you're not sinful, you're just a linear thinker, you're, you're a logical thinker. The only thing I ask is just say to yourself, I hope it's true. Just say, I hope it's true. That's enough for the Holy Spirit to confirm within you that what you're seeing is true. So we're going to repeat this prayer and people who are emotionally tormented, you'll be freed. Those of you who are physically, you need a physical miracle, cancer, whatever. You can, don't, you can't rotate. I know God's going to do a lot because I just feel him like putting all these thoughts in my mind and that's how he talks to me, but I, I'm just going to let him do it. But I also want to say this. There are things that torment you that have not crossed my mind for me to use as an example. just tormented so whatever your need is by the time we finish this prayer I believe that the Holy Spirit will bless you in the way you need to be blessed and so I want everyone to say the prayer everyone because everybody needs a miracle and then we're going to do something a little bit unique because the Holy Spirit is a spirit. We breathe him in. And when we talk, when we pray and we worship, we, we breathe praises out. So I don't want you to pray. I don't want you to breathe in the Holy Spirit. And I don't want you to praise the Holy Spirit. After I say amen, the devil is a spirit. And he can torment your flesh can torment your mind and what I want you to do is by faith I just want you just to just blow out no, don't blow so hard you blow the person's hat off in front of you but just I want it out I want the sickness out I want the torment out. It's a spirit. And I want you to do that after I say amen. And what I've seen when we do this is I've seen people start crying because the Holy Spirit starts touching them. I've seen people start coughing. I've seen people start trembling. This is all a reaction of two things happening. A 
bad spirit leaving or a good spirit blessing. So if you start coughing, shaking, crying, any one of those reactions, I don't want you to stay in your seat. I want you to come down to the altar. An altar is something made of wood, steel, or stone that things die on. I didn't make up the altar. It's not my idea. It started in Genesis, went all the way through Revelations. It's God's idea. Something happens at the altar that I don't, I don't understand. So everyone, stand to your feet. And I want everyone to say this prayer loud enough for you to hear it. Not so loud that it's distracting to the person next to you. That's always annoying when you're standing next to somebody and they're singing louder than the people within the microphone. Are you with me? Come on. It's like, bro, yeah. <laughs> you're killing me, Smalls. <laughs> and so I don't want us to pray that loud. I want us to pray loud enough for, our, for ourselves to hear it. Would you put your hands up like this and just repeat this powerful prayer after me? And if you start crying or you start coughing or you start shaking and you're not able to continue the prayer, just come down to the altar. But if you can, if you can get the words out, power builds as you say it. With your hands raised, your chin up, your eyes closed, visualizing on the precious face of Jesus the best you possibly can. Repeat these words. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins. Come on, let's say that again. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins. Say it, one, two, three. And you rose again from the grave on the third day. You redeemed me with your blood. Say, say, let me finish the sentence before everybody says it. You redeemed me with your blood. That's it. Nobody fall off. Everyone stay with me. I belong to you. And I want to live for you. I confess all my sins to you. I want you to take 10 seconds and I want you to whisper. You don't even have to put voice underneath it. I want you to whisper to the Lord every sin that comes to your mind for the next 10 seconds. Go. If you don't participate, don't expect anything. Go. I confess all my sins, both the known and the unknown. Come on, say it. I'm sorry for them all. I renounce them all. I forgive all others. I'm going to give you another 10 seconds to say the names of the people that you need to forgive regardless of how much they hurt you. I'm giving you 10 seconds. Go. The Holy Spirit is already starting to move in this place. You came here to experience God. If you're crying, if you're shaking, if you're starting to feel like you need to cough, any of those things come down to the altar. Now repeat after me once again. I forgive all others. Say it again. I forgive all others. Even as I want you to forgive me. Forgive me now and cleanse me with your blood. I thank you, Jesus, for the blood you shed. Cleanse me now from all my sins.
I come to you now as my deliverer. You know all of my special needs. The things that bind. The things that torment. The things that grip. The evil spirits. The unclean spirits. Deliver me now. I thank you for the blood of Jesus that is delivering me. I claim the promises in your word that whoever calls upon the name of Jesus shall be delivered. Satan, I renounce you and I loose myself in the name of Jesus. Leave me now and don't ever return. Amen. Now, no more praying. By faith, I just want you to breathe out, whether you're at the altars or you're in your seat. Just begin to blow a steady stream. And do that three, four, five times, six times. Satan, I'm praying, not you. You just breathe out. Satan, I rebuke your sickness. I rebuke illness. Leave them now. Spirit of addiction, I command you to loose them now. Spirit of division within your marriage, I command you now to leave. Satan, you have no authority in this room. In the name of Jesus Christ, leave and don't ever return now. I want everyone just to focus on Jesus and just blow out everything. by the authority of Jesus Christ, the greatest name in the world. Satan, leave. Now. Don't be embarrassed to come down. I don't care if you come down or not, but your freedom depends on your reaction. If you feel the Lord touching you, if you feel something leaving you from the inside or from your shoulders, I want you to come down. If you come down, you start coughing. You cough as many times as you want. Just come down.
if a sickness or an illness or an addiction crosses your mind, I just want you to just... If it crosses your mind, just... Let me pray for you one last time. In the name of Jesus, I speak freedom in this room. Everything, whatever crosses your mind that you do not want in your life anymore, a slow stream, just... I speak freedom in this room right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, freedom. I speak healing in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There's going to be no official dismissal. You can leave whenever you get ready. Some of you might leave in 10 seconds. Some of you might leave in 10 minutes. Some of you might leave in 20 minutes. It's completely up to you. I love you all.